Throughout the Middle Ages, one disease haunted people above all others. It was called the Black Death. And it moved with deadly speed across Europe, wiping out whole cities and killing an incredible 25 million people. Contact with the deadly plague meant almost certain death, or so it was always believed. But here in the remote English village of Eam, a bizarre story has emerged that is changing our perceptions and shedding new light on a remarkable group of people who somehow managed to escape the lethal disease. How did these people survive when others were dying all around them? Stephen O'Brien, an American geneticist who specializes in infectious diseases, has been working for years to solve that very puzzle. It's a little bit like a detective story. When you get closer and closer to solving it and finding out what the answer is, you become more and more excited and convinced that there is an answer and that you're going to get to it. O'Brien's quest to unravel the secrets of the plague survivors began with his work on a different disease. He got interested in the plague because of similarities between it and the modern-day scourge of AIDS. In the autumn of 1347, 12 Genoese galleys entered the harbor at Messina, Sicily. The ships contained a gruesome load. Vile-smelling corpses littered the decks. The few sailors still clinging to life cried out in pain, begging God to forgive them their sins. The ships were immediately ordered out of harbor, but the order came too late. A killer disease had already escaped ashore. Within just 12 months, it gutted the European continent, wiping out a third of the population. Behind the deadly epidemic lay an invisible culprit, the tiny bubonic plague bacterium. Carried by flea-infested rats, the deadly bacteria spread quickly to humans. Wherever the rats went, the fleas and the disease soon followed. Along the trade routes of Europe, the Black Death swept relentlessly northwards. By January, it was in Marseille. Sixty percent of the population died. By the spring, it was in Florence. Seventy-five percent died. And that was only the beginning. Travel stories came back and letters came back about this terrible, cataclysmic illness that was decimating, or decimating, that was um, cutting swathes through the populations of other nations in other locations. And so there was a sense in which um, England, for instance, could watch it approaching them. In September 1348, the first ships carrying the bacteria approached the English shore. Within days, the bubonic plague had made its way to London. Soon, the ghastly signs of the disease erupted across the city. A simple red flea bite led to soaring fever, followed by outbreaks of agonizing black boils in the armpits, neck, and groin. From these gruesome ulcers came the name Black Death. If the infection reached the lungs, it became even more deadly, turning into pneumonic plague that could be spread through the air. The victims had no hope. Death was inevitable. Today, the bacteria are no less lethal. Microbiologists are only allowed to handle them in specially built isolation units. The plague bacterium is certainly one of the most dangerous bacteria that we know. And often within two or three days, exposed individuals have died from pneumonic plague. And the other problem is it carries a very high mortality rate. It's almost 100%. Almost everybody who catches pneumonic plague will die. The non-airborne bubonic plague was somewhat less lethal, but still killed 50 to 60% of those infected. In the end, the Black Death, a horrific mix of pneumonic and bubonic plague, annihilated up to 75% of the European population. I think it's really hard for us to get a grip 
on what it meant for something between 60 and 75 percent of a locality to die. Medicine in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance was rudimentary. There were no cures for diseases. There were only attempts at warding off illness. So fear of the plague is an absolute fear. If you catch it, you'll die. Most knew death was at hand when they received a visit from the dreaded masked doctor. In an attempt to keep himself free of the disease, he wore a long beak-like mask filled with herbs and spices. The losing battle against the plague continued in waves for 300 years, and by the time it finally abated, a total of 35 million people lay dead. To try and limit the spread of the disease, strict measures were enforced. One sick person in a family and the entire household was put under quarantine. You would be locked up for 40 days with the rest of your family. Watchers would make sure you didn't escape, padlocks would be locked on, and if you needed it, nurses would be provided to, to tend to your cares, to offer the necessaries of human life. And th this meant that the sick and the healthy were enclosed, sometimes in deeply fetid circumstances, for a long time. It was effectively a death sentence. After 40 days of exposure to the pestilence, nobody was expected to come out alive. But incredibly, it seems some did manage to survive these terrifying lock-ins. Deep in the London archives, plague historian Justin Champion found clues that not everyone had perished. By comparing the plague registers with burial records from the period, he was able to see just how many people had actually died from the plague in each infected household. Throughout London, he found surprising pockets of resistance. The intriguing thing is, clearly many, many more people contracted the disease than died. The, the images of um, London at a standstill, grass growing up through cobblestones, shows that, that there is widespread um, illness, if not widespread mortality immediately. So we, we have um, the imponderable problem of many people contracting the disease and a high proportion of them dying, but also people who survived having experienced that disease. How had these lucky few managed to avoid death's embrace? What gave them the power to resist the world's most infectious disease? I think all scientists like to make important discoveries and like to, to learn new things. But I think the ones who, who really make the most critical advances are the ones who can't stand not to understand what happened. But to understand the resistance to the plague, O'Brien needed to find an isolated plague-struck area where there were documented cases of people surviving quarantine. Eventually, he found what he was looking for in the quiet village of Eam in northern England. This small town had a unique history that made it the perfect place for O'Brien to study. Hidden in the English countryside, away from the main trade routes of England, Eam might have escaped the plague had it not been for a single parcel from London. According to oral records from the village, in September 1665, a package containing cloth from a London warehouse arrived in Eam addressed to George Vickers, the village tailor. As Vickers hung the damp material out to dry, he had no way of knowing it was infested with plague-ridden fleas. In preparing it to, to lay it out, uh, it's probably shaken. And Vickers, the, the, uh, the man who did the job, uh, was bitten and little red marks appeared on his hands and he didn't realize and 